So I have another success story to tell you about today, and I'm really excited to bring this story to you because she is atypical in some ways, but also fits the story of so many of our patients and members of our Osteo Collective. So I wanna walk you through this patient. She's 51 years old. She was totally surprised by her osteoporosis. And initially our plan was successful, but not as successful as we wanted it to be. And then we were able to make some shifts and see improvement. So if you're on a bone health journey and you have not seen the improvement that you want, despite feeling like you're doing all the things, this may be a really good one for you to listen to. All right, so this patient, we'll call her Joan to protect her uh, anonymity, but she was 51, which is a little bit younger than our average patient. And she had DEXA score of L spine of negative three and femoral neck of negative two. And so you can see here, there's this disparity where she has osteoporosis of her spine, technically osteopenia of her hips, but either way, she was blown away by this diagnosis because she was young, she was active, she's pretty much otherwise healthy, and she was just shocked that she would be in this situation because she felt like she was already living the life, doing all the things, and I bet a lot of you probably feel that same way. So she had gone through menopause recently, and she was put on topical hormone cream, which she felt was adequate, but she wasn't sure, and this was an estradiol progesterone cream, a combo cream. Her history medically was not that interesting other than some back pain. She was already being treated for low thyroid and she had some chronic constipation, which sounds pretty normal, but actually isn't. Her medications included Synthroid at a very low dose, and then she had a supplement stack, which was not insignificant. So the supplement stack included a combo bone product, uh, which was called the Pro Bono Premium Bone Building Pack. And I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but let's just say it's too much calcium among other things. She was using fish oil, she was using a probiotic, she was on 5,000 IU of D, uh, magnesium, which was actually mostly for her uh, bowels, and then also a uh, collagen product. So, you know, some kind of some normal stuff, but already taken a fair number of things. Now her family history was interesting, and you always need to consider this when talking about a comprehensive program, she had a grandmother that died of breast cancer at the age of 45, and she had a lot of heart disease history in her family, multiple people dying of heart disease relatively young. So we always wanna start out any program by asking the question, why are you losing bone? So we take a thorough history, and then we get labs. And her labs showed parathyroid hormone that was totally normal, vitamin D that was okay at 41. Now, I wanna pause for a second and talk about her bone turnover markers, because if you just look at the numbers, they looked pretty good. So her CTX, the breakdown marker was 335. Her P1 and P is 33. So CTX, again, breakdown marker at, 30, at 335, P1 and P at 33. That's the building marker. When you do the ratio of P1 and P over CTX adjusted for units, you get a ratio of 98. Now that ratio is actually pretty low. So even though neither one of those look terrible, the ratio is not good. So she really wasn't in a good starting point when it comes to her bone metabolism. Now, additionally, her IGF-1, which is stands for insulin-like growth factor, it's sort of our what I consider our anabolic switch. Her IGF-1 was also low at right around 100, which we see pretty consistently in women who are in menopause uh, or postmenopause. Now, her testosterone was uh, not being replaced, and her testosterone levels were 30, which is actually not terrible, and her free testosterone was 2.4, which is also not terrible, but she had some symptoms of some challenges of maintaining muscle. Uh, she had some fatigue, brain fog, et cetera, so some of these symptoms of low testosterone that we wanted to consider. Also, we measure FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, and that's a good indicator of estradiol function, receptor activity, and also can help us to understand if we're getting adequate estradiol. And hers was in the 50s, which is too high. We also know that FSH is actually independently related to bone, which is kind of interesting and a topic for another day. Her thyroid looked a little undertreated on her thyroid medication. So her TSH was normal, but her free T3 was under three. And again, some symptoms, specifically chronic constipation, could be related to low thyroid. She had some other symptoms as well. So iron panel looked good. Cortisol wasn't terrible, even though she's an entrepreneur, she's really busy, she has a lot of stress in her life. Cardiovascular risk factor is fine. Homocysteine was a little bit high at 9.2. Omega-3 to 6 index was a little bit low, so some risk there, and her magnesium was a little bit low. So that's the, the, the panel that we have, and again, I didn't go into all the details of that. But for her, we also did a fair amount of functional testing. So we don't do this on all of our patients, but we do it on some of our patients. Uh, certainly do it if they want it, or if we feel like we need it. So we did a, a test called a zoomer, a wheat zoomer and dairy zoomer specifically, which showed that she should not be consuming wheat. She had some increased gut permeability and her dairy 
tolerability was kind of borderline. So we had to talk about that. We also looked at her guts. We looked at function. We looked at microbiome. Function wasn't terrible, but the microbiome was kind of a mess. So after doing all this testing, when we ask ourselves the question, why is she losing bone? The answer for her was probably some gut dysfunction, probably some dietary misdirection, which I haven't even talked about. Her hormones are obviously not optimized. Her thyroid is not optimized. She had some methylation challenges according to her homocysteine and her genetics also verified that she had some challenges uh, from a methylation perspective, which will prevent us from optimizing our metabolism. So the intervention we went with to move forward was to track her food, figure out what's going on with her diet. We went through a gut program with one of our dietitians and we started on the path to optimize her HRT. So let me just pause on that for a second. So for her, she was already on an, an estradiol progesterone cream. So I like the estradiol cream part, but progesterone topically is hard to deliver enough progesterone to balance the estrogen and estradiol adequately. It's also not, it's not shown in much literature to have to be adequate to balance the endometrial lining when you're using adequate levels of estradiol. So we always split that out. I don't like topical progesterone for most people, for most women, because uh, it's going to be hard to measure in blood and it, it may not be enough to balance your uterus. So you're putting yourself at risk. It's possible to use it for sure, but there, there's some nuance to that. So anyway, we switched her to an oral progesterone, uh, micronized progesterone. We used topical estradiol. And then we did add testosterone again, because of her symptoms. Now, obviously a lot of what I'm saying is off label. So take that for what it is. Uh, we also, created a custom supplement plan. Um, we wanted to appreciate her genetics and take that into consideration. We switched her thyroid from Synthroid to desiccated thyroid. And we did that because both her T3 and T4 were low when you look at the free T3, free T4. And we find that when we switch people to a desiccated product, we can see those levels rise and symptoms resolve. So we did all of those things. We updated her training program. So we, we put her onto our customized training program. And then we went forward over the next few months to see how she improved. Now, during that time, she was working with our dietitians. She was working with our coaches. She was very involved in the program, which is really, I think, the, the key to success here. And then we measured her at the six month mark with some new biomarkers. Now, whenever we do this evaluation, we always want to ask, okay, well, we have the biomarkers, but how are you feeling? And for her, she felt great. She had better energy, better vitality. Her cognition was better. Her libido was better. She was just in a really good place in her relationship and with her business and everything was actually going pretty well. But we also have to look at the biomarkers and we have to look at repeat imaging when we have it. So for her, her biomarkers did improve. So I'm only going to talk about the things that are relevant here so we don't waste your time. But her bone turnover markers got better. So her CTX came down. So it was in the mid 300s. Now it's 232 with a P1 and P of 62. So she actually did the impossible and shifted them both in the direction we want to go. That ratio is 267, which is awesome. Now she's also, um, uh, her IGF-1 went up to 188. And if we look at her specific hormone numbers, this is where the hormone optimization is interesting. Her total testosterone was almost 100, but her free testosterone didn't come up that much. So it leaves some room for improvement. Her estradiol was 86 and her FSH dropped to 30, which is about where we want it, but probably still not optimized. Her progesterone is measurable at 3.4. DHEA went up and all of her other markers look pretty good. Her repeat free T3, free T4 are actually in zone. So 3.3 for free T3 uh, and a little over one for free T4. So she's doing great on her desiccated thyroid product and her homocysteine is now lower. So it went from nine to five. So biomarker wise, she looks pretty good. Her hormones are still not quite optimized and she's struggling a little bit with potentially some symptoms of imbalance of estradiol. So we continue to work with that. We actually went forward with some functional testing for estradiol metabolism or estrogen metabolism uh, with a dried urine test called Dutch continue to improve her training and diet. And again, she is feeling great. So she's happy to do all these things working with the team. So then we get a repeat DEXA. So this is where we see some success. So in her femoral neck, her hip, uh, we see that she went from negative two to negative 1.6. So osteopenia getting a lot better. That's up 7%. That's amazing. Her spine went from negative three to negative 3.2. So obviously her spine got worse, 4% down. How is that even possible to get better in one and worse in the other? Well, when we break this down and we start talking to her about these results, she tells us, she says, you know, I have this, ba this back pain and I'm not doing some of these exercises, especially, you know, the stuff overhead because it hurts my lower back. 
So we got together with her exercise physiologist. We came up with a plan to help her to identify how can we load your spine so that we can move forward and get some of this weight on your spine. Because clearly she has all of the, you know, the hormonal and supplement milieu that she needs in order to improve her bone, but she's just not loading her spine. So she, uh, we make some, some changes and we move forward and continue to help optimize her hormones. And now we have her 18 month labs and her 18 month labs are interesting because her CTX P1 and P ratio is a little bit lower, but still over 200. IGF-1 over 200, it's great. Testosterone we bumped up, now her free testosterone looks pretty good. Her FSH bumped up a little bit, and I think that has to do with uh, her estradiol, uh, again, struggling to get her at adequate levels. And so this is just a process, it takes time to optimize hormones, and that's fine. Thyroid's still looking pretty good, and, and now her omega-3 is optimized as well. So overall, again, she's still feeling great. Now we have some biomarkers that look good. The imaging was better, but not perfect, but we made some changes to her exercise regimen and now we have a repeat DEXA almost two years later. So the good news is her hips are stable. Her total hip looks a little bit better. So not a huge change there, but now her spine went from negative 3.2 to negative 2.1. How's that? So almost 19% increase over the course of that year. So it just goes to show that even though she was doing really well, she felt really good, her spine was still getting worse. And it wasn't because she wasn't doing all the right things. And this is why I think this case is really important to bring forward is that even if your imaging continues to look worse, it doesn't mean that what you're doing isn't almost right. She had almost everything nailed, but was just missing one little piece of it. So she had to work with us to, to figure out what that one little piece was, nail it, and then move forward. And now we're seeing the success. So I just love this story because she is now super happy. She's living without that fear of fracture. She knows what she needs to do and she's out there doing it. And she's a huge advocate for what we do. So this is a great case that I think will bring significant for a lot of women. I would encourage you to make sure that your program is totally optimized. If you are struggling to put that together, please consider coming to our masterclass, totally free, link in the description on YouTube, or you can go to optimalhumanhealth.com and you can register for that free masterclass where we talk about the myths, misconceptions, and have a Q&A for people who are trying to improve their bone health. Additionally, if you like this video, you may wanna consider this video, which is another success story, or this video, which is an interview with JJ Virgin, where we talk about her experience in improving muscle and energy after menopause. All right, that's all I have for you in this video. Please remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.